I like to welcome everybody to this uh, seminar co-presented jointly by Centro Primo Levi and Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo. I'm bringing this few um, lines of greetings also on behalf of Stefano Albertini, dear friend and uh, a very close collaborator for, a year, for years, um, who is still in class and will join us later. This is uh, our first program online together after many, many years of um, fruitful cooperation with CASA. And um, we accepted gladly uh, the guidance of our friends uh, at NYU as uh, they have really been at the forefront uh, of the digital revolution in programs that has been brought about by the pandemics. We hope that uh, we can continue to inspire exchanges between different fields of the academia and different lay audiences. And how did this program come about? So through over 20 years of activity, um, Centro Primo Levi's interest in Dante has mainly stemmed from two sources. The fundamental role that Dante has in Levi's work and in the culture of his upbringing in fascist Italy, and the smaller area of our activities focusing on the historical period that goes roughly between what's usually called late antiquity and the medieval age, in which much of what uh, um, would become the so-called Western canon took shape. A time in which the balance of cultural cross influences and the power relations were largely based along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and the mainland behind it. And society and worldview um, have somehow vanished from our conscious uh, to these days. In years of reflection and research on the relation between the tiny Jewish minority and the many ruling systems that have coexisted in and alternated on the Italian peninsula, the question of the larger non-Christian world with which Jews had strong ties, at least up to point, has become increasingly important to us. And uh, Jan Thompson's proposal to organize a discussion on Dante and Islam has come at a propitious time when we are about to embark on a new research project and will definitely benefit from the questions and gaze of a man who, like Thompson, comes to these topics with fresh eyes and a keen sense of their place in our society today. I'd like to introduce our uh, speakers. Um, to members of the NYU faculty who have graciously accepted to be part of this panel and our speaker, speaker Ian Thompson. Alison Cornish has joined the Faculty of Italian Studies at NYU in 2017. She's the president of the Dante Society of America and the author of Reading Dante's Stars and Vernacular Translation in Dante's Italy in Literate Literature. Her, the main themes of her research have been literature and science, as well as vernacular translation. Federica Nikini is also a faculty member at NYU. She's the author of Voices of the Body, Liminal Grammar in Guido Camalgat County's Rhyme, her extensive publication on Boccaccio and Dante are highly regarded. And her current research focuses on the relationship between the urban environment and creativity. And finally, our main speaker, Ian Thompson, is well known in our circle for his much respected and award-winning biography of Primo Levi, Primo Levi Alive, which was recently republished. And Dante's Divine Comedy is his second book-length contribution to Italian culture. Thompson is a respected, a respected public figure in the cultural world as a regular contributor to many publications, including The Guardian, The Observer, Times Literary Supplement, The Spectator, and others. I am extremely grateful to all of you for taking part in this discussion. And I leave the word to Ian, who will lead us through the, the, his research and uh, the development of his book. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. And I'd like to thank the Casa Italiana and the Centro Primo Levi for inviting me to talk on this subject. Originally, I was going to talk on 
Dante um, and Islam in person in New York, but then COVID-19, of course, intervened. And uh, here I am in London from where I'm broadcasting at 9.15 in the evening. Um, I thought I would start um, by describing a little bit about how I came to discover Dante and what Dante means perhaps to the general reader today. Um, and along the way, perhaps I'll um, digress into um, a discussion uh, of some of the writers who are particularly dear to me, like James Joyce and Samuel Beckett, who revere um, Dante today. So my, the story behind my discovery of Dante is somewhat dramatic, but true. Um, I first read Dante when I was um, living in Rome in the early 1980s, um, a second-hand edition of La Divina Commedia with the famous illustrations by Gustav Dore attracted my attention. Uh, I was in my early 20s at the time, and I bought this book, which was the size of a sort of small encyclopedia, an absolutely daunting object. Um, and it kept me occupied during the um, autumn of 1984, when I woke up in a hospital in Rome, acutely head injured and disorientated. My English flatmate had discovered me on the floor of this apartment um, on Via Salaria, um, unconscious. There was a police investigation, but um, it was dropped after it was found that nothing was taken from the apartment. On regaining consciousness in uh, the hospital, the first thing I saw was a group of nuns processing their way down the, hor the corridor towards me. Um, they were wearing these very elaborate white coifs. Uh, so I thought I must be in Paradiso or perhaps in a very bad um, Fellini film. Um, owing to the shortage of um, nursing staff in this hospital of San Giovanni in Laterano, um, the nuns from the nearby church of San Giovanni um, acted as paramedics. And it was they, these nurses, these nuns, uh, who suggested that I sleep on the roof of the hospital because the ward had become so stuffy. So there I was on this extraordinary terrace um, overlooking the Egyptian obelisk that um, Pope Sixtus uh, V had erected in the 16th century. Um, reading for the first time in Italian, Dante. I had read him in English, but never in Italian before. And to my pleasant surprise, I found that Dante wasn't too difficult to understand, even with my um, rather meagre Italian as it then was, or at least not difficult to understand in the sense that T.S. Eliot said that genuine poetry um, communicated before it was perhaps understood. And I think that for many people, um, this poem is the single greatest um, work of uh, literature in the West, let's say, um, begun in the first decade of the 14th century. Um, it gathers together this poem, an extraordinary variety of, an extraordinary range of what we call today literary styles, um, from the lyric, the satiric, the biblical, and of course, invective. And I think it's this um, bold um, intermixture of different registers from the sublime to the vile that in some ways makes Dante such a modern uh, figure still for us today. And of course, as we all know, much of the Divine Comedy was written um, or composed in the Italian expression, sorry, in the Italian vernacular, which Dante regarded um, as the true and richly storied um, expression of the Italian people. I say Italian people because, of course, Italy didn't then exist as a nation, but nevertheless, for the sake of convenience, I'm going to refer to the Italians and to Italy here. Um, Dante said he owed his life to this vernacular, uh, meaning that it was the language that was spoken by his parents. Um, and I think that even when the Divine Comedy um, reaches grandiloquent or um, mannered and evocative sort of Latinist um, language, it still stays the language close to everyday uh, usage. Um, and I, th I think that in some ways, the fault of many of the English translations of Dante is that they uh, use antique turns of um, phrase, where he at, or doth, or ought, or else, or yonder, 
which give the impression that Dante um, wrote in Italian um, that sounded two centuries old to his first readers, which of course he didn't at all. Um, and I think that for me anyway, um, one of the great reasons that I came to Dante was partly due to these different literary registers that I've uh, mentioned that, have, that appear to me to be so very modern, um, but also because in some ways his overthrow of Latin, let's call it that, um, preceded Geoffrey Chaucer's in England by 80 years. Um, and I think Dante's decision to write in his native Tuscan idiom, and um, Federica, you'll correct me here, uh, was a moment of extraordinary significance in the history of, let's call it Western civilization. His rejection of Latin, as I say, preceded Chaucer's, and it ensured that Tuscan, of course, would um, become Italy's literary language and eventually its national language. So I think if Dante is revered today as the patriarch of modern letters, it's partly because of his invention of Italian. And this is why I'm sure that writers uh, like James Joyce so revered him, and I'll come back to Joyce in a minute. Um, one of the big, I suppose, problems that many of us uh, ordinary readers of Dante have is that given our distance from medieval theology, uh, the poet's three-part journey through the afterlife can seem rather hard to understand, rather abstruse at times. Um, but I think that if Dante speaks to us today, as he does, it's not because we fear damnation or are moved by the beauty of the Christian revelation, which of course we might be, but because in some ways Dante wrote the story of an ordinary man, an every man, who sets out hopefully in this life in search of renewal. So the poem is a pilgrimage for me, a pilgrimage of sorts, an act of turning to a better life. And of course, um, Dante's moral progress in the Divine Comedy um, was part of a medieval uh, reality, an actual pilgrimage to Jerusalem or Rome or Compostela, or as Chaucer reminds us, Canterbury, uh, could lessen not only one's own afterlife penance, but also that of deceased loved ones who were already in purgatory's refining fires. James Joyce uh, actually said of the Divine Comedy that it was his um, ballast, his spiritual food. Uh, he said, I love my Dante as much as the Bible. And I think for Joyce, as for me and for many other readers, all life seems to be contained in Dante's great poem. Um, Dante's, in many ways, was an all-encompassing imagination that interwove classical philosophy with Catholic doctrine and contemporary politics. Another great uh, Dantista was the Russian poet Osip Mandelstam, who very rarely left his Moscow flat during the Stalinist persecution, the purges, um, without a paperback copy of Dante in his pocket, lest he should be arrested. And of course, the darker woes to be found in Dante, the long nights of darkness and dismay, uh, were very familiar to Mandelstam, as they were and continue to be to many writers who have been unjustly persecuted or imprisoned. And there's a wonderful story here of Oscar Wilde, who during his lecture tour of America in 1882, in a very strange sort of foreshadowing of his own arrest 14 years later, uh, was invited to inspect a uh, Nebraskan penitentiary. Um, this was, as I said, during his lecture tour of America. And to his utter surprise, he found a copy there of the Divine Comedy, illustrated, of course, by Gustave Doré. He said, oh dear, who would have thought of finding Dante here? Uh, Oscar Wilde then wrote to um, Helena Sickert, who was the sister of the painter, uh, Walter Sickert, strange and beautiful, it seemed to me that the sorrow of a single Florentine in exile should, hundreds of years afterwards, lighten the sorrow of some common prisoner in a modern jail. And of course, Oscar Wilde would remember to ask for a copy of Dante when in prison himself on a charge of gross indecency. 
another writer in this constellation who so admired um, James uh, uh, Dante was um, Samuel Beckett. We know that during his dying days in Dublin, uh, sorry, in, a, in Paris, in a hospice in 1989, he kept a copy of Dante by his bedside in, in the original. Um, and the great poet Derek Mahon used to uh, visit Samuel Beckett on his effective deathbed and found that he was actually rather enjoying himself and enjoying taking tots of Irish whiskey while reciting Dante off, off by heart. Um, and I wanted to read to you very briefly the ninth monologue of Beckett's great 1954 text for nothing, which offers a literal translation of the four concluding words of the Inferno, which of course are, and see the stars again, arriveder le stelle. And these words are spoken by a tramp-like creature as he contemplates death. There's a way out there. There's a way out somewhere. The rest would come. The other words, sooner or later, and the power to go there, and the way to get there and pass out and see the beauties of the skies and see the stars again. On his resurgence from the death-like impasse of hell, Dante Alighieri too will, of course, see the stars again. Um, I think if we move further forward into um, popular culture, I'd noticed that uh, Dante has some kind of bearing um, in computer games, for example. I was talking to my teenage son about this the other day. There's a computer game which I know nothing about called Doom, um, which has a, a sort of strange murky law which refers to nine circles. And the doomslayer in this game, or the hell walker, is a sort of Dantean figure. Um, we might mention then the Lemony Snicket series of books for children and Japanese anime films, all of which uh, reference and allude to Dante. And of course, Dan Brown's Inferno, the fastest selling novel of 2013, was a bibliographic thriller whose sleuth hero, Robert Langdon, is lost in a labyrinth of Dantean symbols and codes. Of course, where Dante's Inferno is awful in the sense of inspiring awe, it could be argued that Brown's book is merely awful. Now, that's another point, though, we'll go on to perhaps later. Um, I would like, before going on to this uh, main subject of Dante and Islam, to talk a little bit about Primo Levi. As Natalia has said in her uh, introduction, the importance of um, Primo Levi of Dante to Primo Levi cannot be um, underestimated. Um, I'm sure some of you will know that um, Primo Levi was really in some ways one of the, the, the last Italians to be educated by rote, and so he was able to recite uh, large parts of Dante um, by heart. Um, in Turin, where he grew up in northern Italy uh, during fascism, he and a group of school friends would have these, would hold these Dante tournaments um, where um, boys, usually boys, would uh, flaunt their knowledge of the divine comedy. Uh, a competitor would recite um, a canto and a rival would win points, would score points if he knew its continuation. And of course, in 1947, when Prima, sorry, in 1947, when Prima Levi published his great um, memoir of the concentration camp, uh, Sequesto e Muomo, if this is a man. Um, there's an extraordinary chapter there, which many of you will know, where Levy um, relates how he struggled at Auschwitz to try and remember lines from uh, the Divine Comedy. And in this chapter, he relates how he and a French prisoner, Jean Samuel, who I was able to interview later and actually corroborate this, the truth of this episode in the book, uh, he and Jean Samuel um, had set out to collect the soup ration uh, one day in 1944, when Canto 26 of the Inferno um, comes back to Primo Levi's memory, haltingly at first and then fluently. Um, and in this canto, the classical Greek hero, Ulysses, is addressing um, his ship's crew as they embark on their final voyage before the sea sucks them under. Think on why you were created. 
not to live as brutes merely, but to follow after knowledge and good. And I think that in the hell of Auschwitz, um, Ulysses' commendation to know and to understand uh, radiates a sublime dignity. Dante's vision, of course, of human knowledge and endeavor in Canto 26, in some ways lies at the heart of the Italian Renaissance. The Divine Comedy might be seen and has been seen by some critics as the first great step from Gothic darkness into the light of the pre-Renaissance. So Primo Levi and Jean Samuel in this chapter, in this extraordinary chapter, are not untermenschen or subhumans as the German Nazi race scientists would have them, would have Jews. They were made men in order to pursue knowledge. Some have actually asked, um, I think rather unfairly, whether Primo Levi really did remember um, these lines by Dante at Auschwitz as though the counterpoint of pre-Renaissance beauty uh, in such a vile place might suggest the uh, artifice of afterthought. But as I said earlier, uh, Primo Levi was among the last generation of Italians to be taught la largely by rote. And so every one of those words from Canto 26 of the Ulysses Canto, and of course, many more words, uh, were committed to Primo Levi's memory. If we come uh, right up to the 1960s, then I think Dante's um, significance becomes rather interesting if we look at um, an African-American playwright like uh, Leroy Jones, who later, I think in 1965, changed his name to Amira Bakara in solidarity with the assassinated black rights activist Malcolm X. Um, but in 1965, Jones published a rather extraordinary novel called The Systems of Dante's Hell. Um, and the hell of this book, uh, as Jones describes it, is the hell of growing up a black man in segregated America. Hell is where white people, in Jones's reading, ref uh, sort of uh, refuse to see Jones as anything other than, as he puts it, a Negro. Um, and so in some ways, um, the style in which this book is written, which is rather staccato and sort of um, disjointed, is supposed to reflect the disunity, I think, of an American hell uh, run by devils or a white devil America, as Jones puts it. And of course, this novel had no sooner appeared than race riots broke out in 1965 in the Watts Ghetto of Los Angeles. And that year of 1965, of course, invited an artist uh, like Rauschenberg to commemorate Dante in an extraordinary series of um, Dante translucences, um, which reflect beautifully the um, uh, quality of sort of alienated majesty of uh, the Inferno. Um, so this actually was the 700th anniversary of Dante's birth in 1265. Um, and one of the images that um, Rauschenberg used in his sequence of Dante uh, images was a photograph of Ku Klux Klansman in robes and hood displaying a hangman's noose from his car window. So I think Dante is always our contemporary. Uh, and he spoke to frightening uh, uncertainties in 1960s America, just as he continues to speak to our troubled moment now. Um, and this brings me in a rather roundabout way to the subject of debt and damnation or Islam in Dante. Um, it might seem strange to many readers of Dante that a poem that seems to be the most emblematic of Christian Europe, the Divine Comedy, should contain so many Arabic uh, loan words, assassin, alchemy, zenith, alcohol, as well as references to Islamic intellectual life, Eastern treatises on medicine, natural science, mathematics, and astronomy. Um, of course, all of these influences had most likely entered the Italian peninsula chiefly by way of Muslim uh, Spain and Sicily, and they left their fingerprints uh, on Dante's great three-part poem. In the face of Islam's rapid um, 
advance westwards. However, Dante also absorbed a fierce dislike and incomprehension of Islam. Um, and pointedly, and I hope that Federica and Alison, you'll correct me here, the only um, word that actually refers to Islam as an actual religion in the Divine Comedy is mesquite or mosques. Um, and mosques in Dante's Christian judgment were a symbol in some ways of stubborn, heretical allegiance and false belief. In the poem's first volume, The Inferno, the pilgrim poet, um, Dante approaches the fortified Islamic citadel of Dis in Lower Hell, where gleaming red mesquite mosques of the sort seen not so long before Dante wrote his poem by the Crusaders in the Middle East, in the Holy Land, emerge from the charred air. And of course, uh, Dan Dante uh, subjects the prophet and his son-in-law Ali um, to a punishment so grotesque that Islam might well protest. In Canto 28 of the Inferno, Muhammad's body is split from end to end while an attendant devil uh, cleaves Ali's face in two. Dante's Maometto is damned not as the founder of Islam, as I understand it, but as the sower of scandal and discord who ruptured Christianity by preaching a nuova legge, a new law. Dante saw Islam as a heretical kind of interpretation of Christianity that aggravated what we might refer to today as East-West antagonisms. His son-in-law Ali, the prophet's son-in-law Ali, is punished um, because he engineered a schism in the Islamic community by founding the Shia sect soon after the prophet died in AD 63. And this broke up the caliphate and set Shiites murderously against Sunnis. So while Ali is left sort of fatally cloven, a sword-bearing devil slashes open the prophet's wound whenever it heals itself. Thus, the dividers, as Dante sees them, of humanity are themselves divided. Understandably, Dante's portrayal of the prophet remains deeply offensive to Muslims. And the Persian translation of the Divine Comedy by the Tehrani poet um, Farid Ahmed Mahdavi Dangami, which was published in Iran in 1999, um, expurgates all mention of the prophet. But I think that there might be possibly a problem in seeing uh, Dante as um, a writer who, in some ways, I suppose, saw Islam as this very unknowable, far distant Orient, um, as it would later become. And, and there have been, um, in the works of Edward Said in Orientalism, um, a sort of image that's been created of Dante um, as, a, as a writer, as a poet, who created a peculiarly, as Said says, disgusting uh, image, an example of Western Orientalism and denigration of Islam. But I think one of the points I wanted to raise today with you, Federica and Alison, is the complexity of Dante's attitude to Islam. So at a time when European romances use the derogatory term uh, mahun for Muhammad, and of course in Islam dogs or hounds, a possible source for mahun, are reckoned to be a ritually unclean animal, Dante consigned three uh, Muslims to the first circle or limbo zone of hell, which was reserved for those who are not wicked enough for damnation, but who are insufficiently redeemed for heaven. And the respect I think that Dante accords these righteous Muslims might frustrate um, accusations of any sort of anti-Islamic Eurocentrism um, leveled by Said. The first of these three Muslims, uh, luminaries, is Saladin, Salah al-Din, um, the 12th century Kurdish Sultan of Egypt who defeated the Crusaders in 1187 and retook Jerusalem. The second, 
uh, is the Andalusian philosopher Averus, whose Arabic commentaries on Aristotle were credited with the survival of Aristotelian philosophy in the West and were thus foundational in some ways of Western Christian civilization. And the, fir the third is Avicenna, another noted medieval Aristotelian. Their only sin, as far as I can make out, is that they were not baptized as Christians. Uh, and so their exclusion um, from salvation, which was inevitable, I suppose, in Christian doctrine, uh, saddens Dante in my reading. Dante says, a great grief seized my heart. Granduole mi prese al cor. Al cor. Um, and I think especially by placing Saladin in limbo, Dante reflects the judgment of his age. In Muslim conquered Jerusalem, uh, Saladin had showed a degree of mercy to his captive, captive crusaders. And of course, um, allowed, um, the right, allowed Jews to the right to, to settle in the holy city. Um, so understandably, um, while Dante's portrayal of the prophet is undoubtedly offensive, um, to use slightly crude language here on my part. Um, I wondered if you could talk perhaps a little bit about um, the complexity of Dante's uh, vision of Islam in the Divine Comedy. Um, his poetic grasp of Islam betrays many of the uh, misapprehensions um, of a time when what we might call today the West uh, Orient divide had widened as a consequence of the Christian wars in the Holy Land of the Crusades. Um, and he followed, I suppose, uh, a medieval Western tradition of being bitterly opposed to um, Islam as a religion. But at the same time, he acknowledges the great debt of the West towards the Arabic works of Averroes and Abicina, Alfragano and others. Um, so perhaps I could start with you, Federica, and ask you um, to enlighten us, enlighten me a little bit on uh, Dante and Islam and his debt to Islam. It's a very um, leading question. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Ian, for sharing with us that beautiful story of you at a hospital. <laughs> Not very beautiful, looking at nuns and, and flipping through the pages of the Divine Comic. <laughs> and... Um, and, and thank you for uh, pointing out yet again at the universal import of a work like the one of Dante. Um, you're right, the, the issue of Dante and Islam is a complex issue that cannot be reduced to a binary uh, mm. position. Um, I would say that Muhammad is in Canto 28 uh, among the schismatic and not among the erratics, and that is uh -huh. an interesting point. Um, as, as the audience might remember, he is um, divided in two, and also 28 is the only canto in the Divine Comedy where the word contrapasso appears. Um, and so the main fault really of Mohammed seems to be in Dante's eyes, the fact that he has uh, introduced a division. And the, the term, the, the, the figure of division and fracture uh, seems quite crucial in Dante's world. If I can step out a little bit from the issue of Islam, I mean, the exile in itself generates uh, a fracture. And uh, of course, uh, I'm also thinking about Guido Cavalcanti, Dante's first friend. Mm. So, so it does seem a motive that recurs and a motive that Dante deems particularly threatening. Um, also when he, in Paradiso, introduces the orders of the Franciscans and the Dominicans, Dante is quite uh, um, desperate at seeing the fracture within the Franciscan order. So, so, so this constant, or uh, at least the ones that he mentions, these divisions are mm -hmm. what uh, seem really to um, uh, pain uh, Dante. Um, probably this more than the strictly erratical uh, part for mm. Mohammed. Uh, Alison, would you like to uh, add mm. something to this?
There I am. Thank you. Thank, yes. Thank you, uh, Ian, for um, for having such success with your book on Dante to bring it really into uh, the consciousness of a lot of people. I know it was the best book of the year in England, according to a couple big journals. Um, and uh, and thanks for engaging us in conversation. So um, yeah, I would I would agree with um, Federica that. Uh, Muhammad is among the schismatics and however gross and grotesque and horrible his punishment is it's they're all pretty horrible and um, we don't just get religious figures in Canto 28 mm. we get sowers of discord uh, in civil strife as well mm. and they're just as horribly if not more horribly uh, punished so Dante seems to kind of connect or that 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 the problem here is religion in the sense of religio that is supposed mm -hmm. to bind people together. And so the, the, the problem here is when Florence is split into Guelph and Ghibelline, when the Roman civil war and, and, and Islam breaking off from Christianity, which is how he saw it, um, are equivalent sins. And I always say, although I realize that the contemporary um, commentators on the canto and Dante's time were not totally clear on this, that they didn't, maybe understand about Ali being the, um, the, the, the origin of the Sunni Shiite uh, mm. split. However, you do get the sense that Dante is aware of it. And uh, I always say that it's one thing for Muhammad to be in there, uh, to be understood as somebody who split Christianity. But if Ali is in there, he is there because he split Islam. And that, to me, suggests that Dante sees Islam as important of uh, an organ of political unity as any other, right? And that the problem is the splitting of it, and and that's what's being emphasized there. So, as mm. Federica said, you know, he's in he's in schism and not heresy, and um, and it's Dante seems to be a little bit original in this kind of thing, and among in the heretics canto, which is in a whole different section of the inferno so it's in violence or on the outskirts of violence whereas muhammad is put in down in fraud okay so what you know why is that yes. why are the heretics among the violent mm. and 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 the schismatics are among the fraudulent and also among the heretics we don't meet any cathars or albigensians or or you know people who re had religious differences the people that we meet are I think of them as bourgeois Florentines, you know, mm. or, or more upper middle class, let's say, mm. Florentines who uh, are accused of uh, heresy, are uh, actually kind of a part of Florentine cancel culture. That's the case of Farinata del Uberti, because it's, uh, you know, to call someone an ep Epicurean, to call someone an unbeliever is a kind of insult. And mm. he was, you know, dug up and burned posthumously mm. and all that kind of thing. Um, so, so those people aren't other, right? They're they're totally Florentine. They're if yeah. they're atheists, they're they're Christian atheists, right? Mm. And and so, and then there's a third place which you've already mentioned that I like to I'd like to um, talk about for a second. This is limbo. So if it's just a question of difference in belief, Dante has a place for that, and Dante <clears throat> invents that place because limbo was not for pagans. That's Dante's invention. <clears throat> a place to put Virgil, right? Uh, limbo had uh, the reasons for Limbo's be being, and mm. you may know that the Vatican has since canceled Limbo, so we're not sure where all these people mm. are now, but um, but uh, the point of Limbo was the problem of unbaptized babies who were obviously innocent, but at the same time not innocent because of the doctrine of original sin. And then you have the problem of the patriarchs so that the Jews of the Bible expecting the Messiah cannot be damned. So there has to be some place for them. And so the bosom of Abraham, as Shakespeare would say, mm. it, it becomes the limbo, this waiting place. But Dante mm. uses this place to put as you say, I mean, people who don't share his faith and yet are great people. They're not mm. just okay people. They're like great people. They're mm. not, they're not neutral people. They're not right. They are the great people. And I always talk about limbo as, as it's look. it's got really smart people. It's got all the smartest people there, right? It's got all the um, heroic people there. So athletes. Mm. Okay. And it's got the beautiful people there. So and it it has very green grass, very well manicured, and it's got a kind of little bit of light, and it's got Gothic architecture. It looks 
like Oxbridge. Okay, so it's a college campus, and when you say that Dante was sad to put the um, to put the uh, the admired uh, 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 intellectuals there, as long, as well as Saladin, who's also right, he's not an intellectual; he's a warrior, so honor him as well. Um, and the sadness about Virgil, Dante is the first tragic reader of Virgil, right? He loves Virgil. Who does he love more than Virgil, right? Uh, and yet, and yet. Why, why do they need to be? So he actually is creating a, a place for them, which is higher than you would normally expect. Mm. He's kind of mm. saving them in some sense. Mm. And uh, they are not wicked at all. They're not not so wicked, as you said. They're not wicked at all. They're, they're like, Virgil says, mm. they did not sin, which is mm. something a Christian would never say. But, but that's what Virgil says. So they did not mm. sin. They just didn't have faith, mm. which, you know, you, you might think is a technicality, but maybe that's what we're getting down to, it's very important to Christians yeah, so, and to Muslims. It's not a, a small thing. Mm. And it's not only not, it's not a crime. It's not a sin not to be baptized. It's just a fact. And what, what baptism is, it's, it's marking you with the faith. And mm. remember, faith is belief. And so the people who are in limbo do not believe that there's any better place. In fact, limbo looks very much like the Elysian fields of, um, of, of Virgil and the Aeneid. So in a certain sense, they mm. get exactly what they expected, a place under the earth that has green grass and sports, okay? And, mm. um, and, and they don't believe in heaven. So how can you go to a place you don't even believe in, right? Mm. So, um, so, so that's what I would say about that. Yes. I, I, mean, well, I feel yeah. like I've talked a lot, so I'll let you go. No, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. But picking up on your point, Alison, about um, Mohammed being in Canto 28 uh, as a... Um, for schism, not for heresy. Um, I wondered, Federica, if I could ask you about the fact that it's not just the Prophet and Ali, of course, um, who suffer violence in the Inferno as schismatics. Um, whether they are Muslim or Christian, most of them are Christian, uh, Dante's damned souls are frequently twisted and torn and pricked and gnawed by devils and harpies. Um, in some ways, the Inferno could be seen as a sort of giant um, judicial machine in which God's justice is vindicated uh, before all men. Um, subjects, it subjects Muslims and Christians um, alike um, to some sort of merciless sort of sword, if you like. Um, and I wondered whether, to go back to Edward Said again, uh, he doesn't or perhaps doesn't wish to um, acknowledge Dante's rather ambiguous view of Islamic culture. So the, the prophet, let's say, is vilified by Dante as a Christian schismatic rather than a heretic. Um, but at the same time, um, Dante displays, as you know, we perhaps have established this sympathy for Arabic culture. And even according to one critic, uh, a Jesuit, um, Spanish priest, um, Palacios, Palacio. can, claims that Dante was actually borrowing from um, Islamic um, texts. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, this, I suppose, more nuanced view of Dante and Islam? I know it's repeated. Why, why do you say ambiguous, just to make sure I understand? Why do you um, say Dante is ambiguous? Well, his view of Islamic culture on the one hand could be seen as um, understandably offensive to Muslims today. Um, for example, in 2002, there was a, an Islamicist plot to blow up the Cathedral of San Petronio in Bologna um, because there's a 15th century painting there, a fresco of hell by Giovanni da Modena, which depicts Muhammad's sort of graphic mortification by devils taken directly from Dante. Um, but, um, as Alison says, you know, the three um, in limbo, the three Muslims in limbo, are not subjected to the same degree of um, vilification that the Prophet is, although they're Muslims. Um, so I wonder whether some people do tend to think of Dante and Islam as being very starkly sort of uh, black and white, um, whereas there's this whole sort of rich hinterland of um, debate that could be had really about 
Dante and um, Islam? Yeah, I mean, as, as I mentioned before, I don't think it can be reduced to a, a binary uh, position. Sure. And um, I do agree with Alison. I mean, many, many souls receive awful treatment in, mm. in hell. And um, I, don't, I don't think that Muhammad receives a particularly bad one, in fact. Mm. Uh, that could be singled out. Uh, well, it has a it has a meaning, like all the punishments. I mean, the yeah. point is the splitting, right? And then the, yeah. the double split that Ali and Muhammad share, a one split, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. There's a meaning to it, yeah. And as you said, Federico, Canto 28 is the only canto in the Inferno that mentions the word contrapass. Can you did, enlighten us a little bit about what that means in terms of its significance with Islam, with the Prophet? Well, well, contrapasso in general is a, a sort of a, a law that, no, not really a law. I mean, it, it's a set of rules uh, mm. that connect punishment with the sin. And yeah. uh, in the case of Muhammad, again, since he is targeted as a schismatic, mm. uh, his uh, body um, is divided in two precisely because it illustrates that kind of punishment, illustrates how Muhammad has divided uh, the religious community. Um, and so it's, it's a very clear, direct uh, contrapasso. Um, yeah. But again, it, it's, it's not a punishment directed at Muhammad, it's a punishment that enlightens this uh, issue of division, of mm. uh, divisiveness, which again, for Dante, is uh, clearly uh, uh, something very familiar, very painful, and very um, problematic. Yes. Uh, right. Okay. I, I mentioned earlier the um, the book that was, I think, published in 1919 um, by a Madrid University. The Palacio. Yeah, more of Arabic studies. Um, now, he was a Jesuit priest, I think, um, Miguel Asin Palacios, who argued that Dante had not only uh, taken, but he doesn't say plagiarized, but not only had he taken from Muslim sources, um, but was indebted to Islamic eschatological traditions. Um, and in Professor Palacios' opinion, uh, the Divine Comedy was not perhaps quite an original work uh, because Dante used a wealth of Islamic writings on the afterlife. Um, I don't think that, as, that Palacios was trying to denigrate uh, the Divine Comedy um, in any way. He wished merely to establish... Um, Islamic linkages and motifs. Um, and one, I, I, of course, this, you know, his book rather upset, I think, quite a lot of um, critics at the time, perhaps particularly in Italy. Especially um, Italian Dantisti, yes. Yes, it would seem that Dante's kind of Christianity and very identity as a European um, were undermined by this assist insistence on a debt to a non Christian precedence. Um, well, well hey, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know, hmm. the debt to the non Christian is that's for sure, right? We got Virgil, right? There's all of classical that's culture. Me. So it can't be the debt to the non Christian. There may have been some nervousness about Islam in particular. I don't know. And, but as you know, that the, hmm. the actual evidence that anybody could have known the Quran, the Quran at, uh, mm -hmm. at, at the time was not there. And in 1949, some evidence, well, evidence, a text yeah. came out that there's a Latin text, but, but in 1919, that was not the case. So a wealth, a wealth of Islamic like stuff, like, no, we, we didn't have the, mm. we didn't have the smoking gun uh, at the time. So mm. Um, mm. it wouldn't have yes. even have been possible yeah, to think that way. I wonder if it was even known at the time um, that uh, the prophet died on the same day as his muse and great love, Beatrice de Portinari, on the June the 8th. Um, if so, I wonder whether the coincidence would have pleased or dismayed Dante. I mean, well, I don't know that. I don't know that Dante knew that. But when he when she dies, Federica, remind me. But doesn't he go through all the calendars of all the different religions? So the thing that Dante is, yes. and there's a question in the Q and A yep. about about how to how to how to be inclusive, basically. And I would say that Dante is constantly saying, well, as the Arabs say, as the Saracens say, mm. as the Greeks say, as the, right? he's mm. always saying, he's always trying to find points of agreement mm. in, um, in, in thought uh, because he thinks the truth is only one. And so not, you know, everybody's trying to get at it and we use mm. 
whatever wisdom we find wherever we find it. So, um, yeah. So I, I don't think he thinks it's like, well, let's just humor these people and humor those people. It's like, mm. if they're getting close to the truth, let's use them. And, and, and certainly he knew that uh, Averis was a, was a Muslim, but, but he, for him, the important thing was that he wrote the commentary on Aristotle, right? And that was the yeah. thing, and that they're both approaching Aristotle. So I'm sorry, yes. but Hazidika, no, no, what do you think? Absolutely. No, 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 the, exactly the same thing. Yeah. Like, the, like the, these, uh, there are all these links uh, connecting yeah. um, realms of knowledge that and certainly mm. they're very important for, for Dante. And uh, yeah, inclusion is a key word for him, which yes. has, for his idea of a unity mm. and community. Um, could I ask you perhaps a question about um, Dante's youthful career as a Tuscan dialect poet, roughly, I suppose, from the 1280s uh, to the mid 1290s. Um, this seemed to have been connected in some ways to the poetry that flourished in Sicily, um, at the Palermitan court of um, Frederick II. Um, I mean, of course, Dante later condemned Frederick II to the fiery tombs of the heretics, I think, in Canto 10. Yeah. I'm not actually sure why. Perhaps you could enlighten me on that. But the point is here that I'm interested in is really how much of this um, Mediterranean, Sicilian, Saracen, Arabic culture, is it likely that Dante would have absorbed through the dialect, through, through the poets who were operational at the court of Frederick II? In um, Sicily. Um, what, what the, I'm afraid that there is not enough evidence to support that. The Sicilian mm. poets were mainly translating first, really, and then mm. writing under the inspiration of mm. uh, French poets. And so there, was no, it, there is no textual evidence, Alison, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. of a contamination between um, Arabic poetry and the Sicilian poetry despite the fact that Sicily was certainly open to uh, Arab influences, of course, but not in that specific respect. Yeah, unfortunately, we all want to see it there. There's a book by uh, Carla Millette called The Kingdom of Sicily, in which, you know, but she too comes up with this kind of parallel, but where's the where's the leap? And it's it's not quite there. It's the, 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 again, the smoking gun is not yes. there. But yes, of course, it's very tempting to think that there must have been, and people have written about the Fedeli d'Amore, you know, in, in uh, Vita Nuova, that that had a kind of Sufi yeah. mystic something behind it. I'm, you know, I'm very, I love mm. Maria Corti's, um, you know, that the pillars of Hercules that we mm. think of as maybe a classical thing, the thing that Ulysses goes beyond, mm. that that's actually an Islamic myth, that that the you shall not go beyond mm. the Mediterranean was was, was actually... Um, it was actually a Moroccan Islamic myth. So, so it's very, it's all very mm. tempting. It's just that, unfortunately, there wasn't that much yes. really communication. There's a huge language problem. There's an alphabet problem, you know, between the two cultures. So, um, so there really wasn't that much, um, well, yes. very little exchange on that level. Certainly there was mm. other kinds of exchange, mm. but. Um, uh, yes, and, and Erika, as you were saying, the, um, the poetry that the, um, or the love lyrics, I suppose, that were being written um, at the court of um, King Frederick II were in some ways indebted to the lyric versifiers of, of southeastern France, the troubadour. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, that, that but there nice. must have been, oh, there might have been, or one likes to think there might have been Arabic influences coming through their verse somehow. I mean, were these poets perhaps indebted in some ways to uh, Arabic poets that had gone before them? Um, um, I, I, I'm afraid I'm not, I don't yeah, know sure. enough about Arab poetry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the relationship between uh, French poetry and Sicilian poetry is so strong. Yes. And so, how can I say, directly uh, um, documented that mm. it's uh, actually... Mm, I, I, I don't go as far as saying that mm. the, some Arabic influence can mm. be found. Mm. Really. Um, and of course, some of these uh, poets um, fetch up, as it were, in the Divine Comedy. Uh, Giacomo Dallentini, um, an important Sicilian poet, appeared yeah. in Purgatory, doesn't he, as mm -hmm. the victory, a lawyer, a notaro. Um, 
And he was born, I, I think he came from Catania, in Sicilian Catania. From LinkedIn, yeah. Which have had um, a huge Arabic presence, nevertheless, still, you know. And I suppose it is merely fanciful and romantic, as Alison has said, to assume that there might have been um, an Arabic kind of influence running through their verse into Dante. Um, but what we can't, I think, ignore is that there was... Um, that Arabic sonorities and, if you like, uh, Islamic uh, sort of Islamic lyric tradition is detectable, surely, in some of the verse of these writers. Um, Dalkamo, he, he, he used this extraordinary image of um, of the rose. I mean, the euphonious rosa fresca, aulentissima, sweet-smelling, fresh red rose. In, and the way he divines a trace of the loved one's face in the moon, these could conceivably come from kind of Arabic or sort of motifs in poetry. There might have been a kind of transference there of um, ideas and images. But we're, we're in the land of speculation at that point. Yeah, yes. it's just that philologically we, we just don't have it. But sure, we'd all like to, to, to think it. Um, yes. Well, I suppose what but, these uh, poets did invent was the sonnet, though. Um, or so it said, is that right? I mean, you know, the, the idea for me is always the most extraordinary to reflect the Shakespearean or sonnet um, somehow had its roots um, in Sicily, in the Mediterranean. Yeah, again, in the land of speculation, certainly mm. there, there, there were those uh, atmospheres circulating, but, it, yeah. but it's hard to find them uh, in, in, in writing. There are a couple of questions. Yes. Um, yeah, one, I, I did mention um, Carla Millet's book. Yeah, um, and so there is, a, there is a, 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 a translation we now know into Latin of the Quran. I don't know that it was in Florence. Is that true? Anyway, it's in definitely okay. in Latin, so it's yeah. possibly available. There are not that many copies. And the Liber mm -hmm. uh, Scale, the li Libro della yeah. Scala, which doesn't survive in Arabic. So that's wonderful. I mean, Quran obviously survives in Arabic, but the Libro della Scala doesn't survive in Arabic, but it does survive in Latin and mm -hmm. old French. Um, so, 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 right. And so we don't even have the Arabic original to compare it to. And so... Who knows how many cultural influences are getting yes. into these uh, things that that have been um, that that have uh, survived? Mm. Uh, but the other the other super interesting uh, thing that Carla Millet has talked about, but also Heather Coffee, is the uh, the Shak al Sar. I think it is uh, this um, this idea of Muhammad's purification, and so his that that he was opened up actually, mm -hmm. so that that it that Dante might have known that. And so the opening up of Muhammad, because Muhammad does do a kind of revealing kind of thing, a kind of revelation, like a religious figure re reveal. And of course he is, he's the prophet. He's the one who reveals mm -hmm. the word of God in God's own language, which is Arabic. And so that opening up and that the Shaq al Sadr is called, is is a opening up and, and uh, God puts his hand directly on his heart and there's the chill of God's hand on the heart and so forth. So that's super interesting as mm. an idea. And then um, you asked about Frederick II, why, you know, why he's uh, condemned for heresy. Well, <laughs> for one reason, he was ex excommunicated uh, by the Pope because the Pope was always having uh, uh, fights with the emperor. Um, mm. But then Frederick's son, Manfred, is saved. And Manfred, uh -huh. who says, my sins were horrible, and he's saved. <laughs> um, so again, it's not about being less wicked. He's totally wicked. And and uh, he's also somebody who fraternized quite a bit with Muslims in the, the town of Lucera, uh, mm. which was actually a, a kind of Muslim ghetto where Frederick had put Muslims, you know, to get to get the troublesome Muslims out of out of the way, you know. So there, there's a, yes, there's a lot a long history in it, but um, of, uh, of this, these things mm. being uh, mm. connected and and crossing over and and so forth and um, and uh, Muhammad, sorry, uh, Manfred, um, Manfred, just the way Muhammad shows his wounds, his big mm. wound. So Manfred shows his wounds from a battle where he was killed by representatives of the church. And, and they're like, they're like the wounds, 
you know, the, they're like the glorious wounds of the martyrs, right? These wounds that will be even on the resurrected body because they're a sign of glory, which is something that maybe we were supposed to talk about as well as Kacha Guida, who would be the crusader ancestor of, yes. of uh, yeah, maybe want to talk about him a little bit. Yes, Federica, perhaps um, Kacha Guida, who would have been Dante's great, great grandfather, I suppose. Yeah. Um, who... Caccia Guida degli Elisei, who is this rather pugnacious and sort of haughty character in yeah. uh, the Divine Comedy, who we believe, we think, died a crusader's death uh, in the Holy Land in about 1148. Um, and he doesn't sort of pull any punches, he says there, about um, Muslims, they a gente tur. I don't know yeah. how you translate that, but perhaps foul race or something like that. Yeah. Uh, foul people, yeah. Um, he announces this to Dante, to his face. Um, and this Caccia Guida is exalted among the, the blessed sort of souls of heaven. And so Dante here is in some ways claiming a crusader ancestry for himself, is he? Through Caccia Guida. Yeah, I, I don't know how relevant is in the Count of Cachaguida that specific component of mm. Cachaguida. Uh, I think Cachaguida is there for um, other reasons uh, mainly, and I think he embodies uh, mm. other important motives connected to mm. the Divine Comedy. And I think that uh, that is so like a tangential uh, information. Uh, do you agree, Alison? That, that well, he ends his. You know, he ends his. It's the self-presentation of, uh, you know, how Florence could have, could not just could have been, but was, right? Was, this idea yeah. that, that there actually was a historical Florence when things worked, okay? When, when the trains ran on time. I mean, like when things <laughs> functioned, that everybody did what they were supposed to do, and right, that it wasn't too big, it wasn't too rich, it was sober, it was chaste, yeah. it was tranquil, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And he ends it, I mean, the last line of Canto 15 is, e venni dal martiro a questa pace. And he's talking about, you know, that's right, where the gente turpa is. So it's definitely, he's talking about going on crusade. He's mm. talking about um, the people who usurp, popolo usurpa. So that, you know, from the Christian point of view, of course, Muslims had you know, Muslims were not the weak, the weak people. They were the people who were in power in mm. uh, the Holy Land and and uh, lots of places, and and uh, for, had been for a very long time. It's not like they had just invaded. Um, and so, um, uh, I would say the one thing that Dante is really against, and maybe this violence that you you rightly perceive in his his condemnation of Muhammad and everything. This he's against division, and so. Of course, we think of crusades as being divisive, but but Dante says the, it's sort of like the only war you might want to fight for for Dante is about what you believe, and we might mm. think, oh, that's terrible, and so. But we, you know, we even use the word crusade now when we're on Twitter. <laughs> Twitter, you know, it's like we're on a crusade yeah. against those horrible people, right? And we uh, we we think they need to be you know expunged because they're mm. so horrible and so forth. So it's a kind of language. So 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 Dante thinks that. You, the, the, you should not be fighting against your 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 fellow citizen, right? Which is what they were doing in Florence. Mm. Federica is Florentine, so they, right? you should not be you should not be fighting against your brother, your neighbor, right? It's the fratricidal city. I mean, you bring up the the mesquite, and maybe we'll talk about that in a minute uh, more mm. about the urban landscape. But mm. um, you know, for the hell, the, the, the hell is not so much Muslim as Thebes. Okay, that's the fratricidal, dysfunctional family. That's the right. Okay, so so Cachaguida uh, does go to the Holy Land, and he you know, everything's the, the right way around. So he's knighted by an emperor. It's the emperor who's conducting war, not the pope, right? So that's super mm. important. It's the Emperor Conrad, and um, and even wrapped up in the language about how, okay, he's going off to fight the infidel, which is exactly how the Muslims would describe it, fight the infidel. Um, it, it, he says, and then there I was released from this mondo falace, which is that the world itself is, it, you know, is full of deceit. And it was just this Christian sentiment that, that, that to leave the world is okay. So it's all, it's been all about how he was the great, you know, good citizen of Florence and the life on earth was just 
perfect and everybody was happy and everything. But even so, it was the monde falache and that idea that the that the real peace, questa pace, is mm. is going to be paradise. And there is in what Kacha Guida says the notion of jihad. Right. Mm -hmm. There is that notion that because the crusader, right, it was killing for the faith and not for money and not for plunder and not mm -hmm. for territorial conquest, that that is a holy battle, mm -hmm. unlike all other battles. And so that's something that um, uh, that uh, well, there, there's an interesting history about how the Christian. Christians became to see, came to see, after all, they're supposed to turn the other cheek, how they came to see that maybe holy war would be a just war. And um, and maybe they got it from kind of seeing how the Muslims, who were awfully successful, had conquered vast swaths of territory mm -hmm. and held on to it very successfully. So there is this kind of, right, there is that 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 jihad there. Um, and, and of course, it's with Kacha Guida that Dante gets his own mission spelled mm. out, which is you are going to suffer, right? The way of the cross is suffering and you have to bear witness. And of course, martyr means witness. It means to bear witness. And what Dante has to do is to write his poem, which you say, well, it's okay. You All you have to do is pick up the pen, but of course he's going to be in exile. And so he's not going to make friends if he tells the truth. So it really isn't going to be easy to to, to do this thing. And so that too is that we could call it jihad, which is a struggle, mm. right? That you have to do this because you're called to do it and you do it in the name of truth, which is another word for God. Mm. Mm. Um. Picking up on one of the questions here about the Liber Scala, I know this is actually going even further into the realm of speculation and um, romance perhaps, but I wonder if there were several ways in which this book could have come to Dante in its various translations. Alison, you say we, the, the Arabic original has been lost. Um, mm -hmm. There's no record of it. And so I think it was probably translated from the Arabic into Castilian in the mid 13th century by a Jewish physician. Um, mm -hmm. And then- Under in turn, also, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and in, in turn, this Castilian version uh, served as the basis for the Latin version and possibly mm -hmm. an old French version. Um, and these last two versions um, may have um, been the work of the Tuscan lawyer poet Bonaventura of Siena, it's been put about by some critics I've seen, whose patron was King Alfonso X of Castile, known as the learned. Alfonso was a very cultivated sovereign, of course, um, who encouraged the translation of Arabic works into Castilian uh, vernacular. And I wondered whether we can talk a little bit here, Federica, about um, Bruno Latini, um, who was, of course, Dante's mentor and teacher. Uh, he was a, an orator, he was a notary, um, among the first in the Middle Ages to urge a return to Greco-Roman culture. And so in some ways paved the way for what became the European Renaissance maybe. Um, between 1259 and 1260, Latini served in Seville as the Florentine ambassador to Alfonso X. Um, and of course, today, thanks to Dante's portrayal of, Latin, of Latini as a, as a sodomite, um, he's more famous or notorious for that than for the great 13th century humanist, perhaps, and that he was and a transmitter of Arabo Andalusian culture. Um, I was wondering if it's at all possible that Latini would have introduced Dante to. Um, an Arabic text like the Liber Scalae. Book of the Ladder. Yeah. I mean, well, who knows? It's just a Right, yes, exactly. It, it, is definitely, it is an interesting possibility. There is also a Dominican friar, if I'm not mistaken, who had Ricardo. traveled. Exactly, mm. Ricardo, who had been an Islamist and then went back to Santa Maria Novella mm. in Florence and yeah. most likely did include in his... Uh, preaches material coming from the Islam. So yeah, mm. definitely, that is a possibility, certainly. Yes, uh, and Latini's uh, two or three years in medieval Iberia would have coincided with a time when there was a degree of tolerance, um, you know, a convivencia, a sort of living mm -hmm. together um, mm -hmm. of Islam and Catholic Christianity. 
um, quite unlike what was to come later under Ferdinand and Isabella in 15th century Spain. Yeah. So yeah. an idea of sort of tolerance. And I suppose in some ways, since we ought to wrap up soon and take some more questions maybe, um, in some ways, I like to think of the author of the Divine Comedy as having been exposed possibly to the cultural Arabia of the Mediterranean in some forms. And as a writer who, a writer, as a poet, who had the philosophic temper to see that Islam was more than just, more than just schism or Alison, you mentioned the word jihad, um, albeit on the Christian side and on the Muslim side through Kachaguida. Um, and that for Dante, Islam was this sort of marvel that proclaimed um, the spirit of Saladin, that proclaimed uh, maybe the Sufi law of Andalusus, you know, of Spanish um, Arabia. I like to think of Dante as a sort of conduit, a channel who might have sort of brought all these influences to bear, if subliminally, if unconsciously, on some of his work while respecting completely that this may be a lot of it in mere speculation. It's very pleasurable though, to sort of philosophize on these potential uh, Arabic links with Dante. Um, and I think that's pretty well all I wanted to say. Thank you both very much, Alison and Federica, for talking and actually teaching me a lot tonight um, and picking me up on a few um, I did want to ask Federica about the mesquite because I know you've worked about yes. on the walls of yeah. So what do, what do you do with that? The, the yeah, mosque, I I, uh, I don't well, um, I, I don't think that again yet mosquitoes mm -hmm. are essential there. I think that the ur urban landscape of this is uh, essential for one component that is walls, uh, because when uh, Virgil and Dante go across the walls, there is a, a a progress in the understanding of mm. the journey and of the words. So it's it's a, um, it's a step crucial for the constant progression of understanding of the journey. Mm. Uh, so mm. again, I but it's just uh, what I think that the the, um, the use of the word mos mosquitoes uh, doesn't necessarily target that city as uh, an Islamic erratic city. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, but it's true that there are a lot of Arabic not, words. Yeah. It is true. Mm -hmm. In Italian. Um, but is this actually an Islamic citadel in the poem? Uh, I mean, if we, except for the use of the term mesquite, I don't, I mm. not mesquite, I there see. are no other elements right. that I see. allow for uh, yeah. identification as an Islamic mm. city. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think on that note, we better wind up. But thank you again very much, Alison and Federica, for talking to me on debt and damnation, Islam in Dante. And if there are any more questions, please, please um, do put them to us. There's only one here still. Um, yeah, this is from Andrea Andrecelli, who, who, talk, who talked about some yeah. things that we've talked about. Yeah. Some okay. Libre de la Scala and so forth. So. Okay. There's Natalia. Hello, Natalia. Okay, yeah, I really like to thank you all. I think uh, um, this last question of Ian uh, is um, pretty loaded and may really lead to um, more research. I hope so. I want to add that um, this was very interesting and it's clearly the exchange between different uh, uh, views of, uh, of the past and of how we study history. Um, one thing that perhaps was not mentioned is that um, the lack of evidence is, reflects the history of research, the history of how we study and how we learn, and not primarily um, an, ab an absolute reality. Um, as Said was uh, uh, called, in, uh, called upon in this conversation, perhaps another scholar who thought about this should be considered, and is Piva, can the, uh, you know, can people who have um, been expunged from Europe in very punctual and careful way have left 
a trace. Um, recently, recent studies show that in Rome, the catechumeni um, targeted almost as many Muslims as Jews. And yet we know nothing. We have no trace of this Muslim. And so when we study and we say, well, there is no evidence in speculation, speculation is also an attempt to imagine that we can see a world in which uh, whose future would have been different. And I think the, the effort of the historian is really to step in that possibility, the realm of possibility. And yes, of course, we don't have um, only in the past 20 years, scholars from the Muslim world have began to study Islamic literature on the Crusades because mm. this has been of no interest in the West. Mm. And so we're really missing a voice in its totality. And this puts it in a place where it is almost um, impossible to get results or to come out with some, we, we're speaking to a wall. And I think that's uh, something that we really need to think about as scholars and lay people. So with this, I just like to, to wrap it up. I'm really grateful, Alison and Federica and Ian for uh, uh, you know, putting your thoughts and energy to, into this talk. And um, I hope we'll have more of this. Thanks for inviting yeah. us. And thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And um, to Julian, who is uh, coordinating everything behind the, the scene, and to Stefano, who has been a fabulous partner for so many years. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, Natalia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Grazie. Buonasera. Buonasera.